Greetings, and thank you all for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. We're very excited to have Colleen Iverson here to present to us today at our last official science seminar of this academic year. Before we turn it over to Colleen, a few logistics. We have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you would like to use it, please find the CC button in your Zoom menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by a Q&A. As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. We also have a meeting chat. Feel free to use this to share links and other items of interest, but add speaker questions to the Q&A. We will facilitate discussion at the end, and there should also be opportunities to ask questions over audio if that is what you prefer. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation, as outlined in our NEON Code of Conduct. This applies to NEON staff, as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. Full Code of Conduct is available via a link that I will share in the chat in a moment, and is also embedded in the Science Seminar webpage. So if you scroll down here below the list of speakers, uh, you can find our code of conduct. And I'll share the link for this whole webpage in the chat in a moment as well. This talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing on the Neon Science Seminar webpage. And lastly, if you have ideas for a talk for this seminar series, we are recruiting speakers for next year, please nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling in the form on our Science Seminars webpage. It's right here near the top, nominate a speaker. All right, with that, I will turn it over to Shashi Kanduri to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Anne. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the speaker for the Neon Science Seminar series today. Uh, Dr. Colleen Iverson is an ecosystem ecologist who uses a variety of field and lab-based techniques to understand and predict how ecosystems from upland forest to flooded peatlands to thawing arctic tundra are shaped by environmental change. Uh, Colleen wears various hats. She is a distinguished staff scientist in the Environmental Sciences Division at Oak Ridge National Lab. She is uh, the group leader of the Plant Soil Interactions Group. Uh, she's an editor. Uh, at the International Plant Journal, The New Phytologist. Uh, she is also the director of the NG Arctic Project, uh, and she was an elected Early Career Fellow of the Ecological Society of America. And she's a member of the inaugural cohort of New Voices at the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. <clears throat> Colleen sees science communication as the foundation for a shared understanding of society's future, and she has shared her scientific vision on Public Radio International. Science Friday, and in the Alder School's Flame Challenge, as well as in several organized symposia, sessions, and workshops. Uh, on a personal note, I've had the experience of working closely with Colleen. Uh, this was uh, back in the good old days in 2019 when I was a grad student. Uh, Stan Bullschlager, who was the then director of NG Arctic, and Colleen were kind enough to accommodate me to work on their project. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot, Colleen, for accepting our invitation to present at the seminar series. Uh, both Sam and I were super excited back in uh, last year fall when we saw the acceptance come through, um, and uh, we really hope that the that the talk today would uh, would spark some of the conversations around how uh, neon data could be used better to uh, address some of the questions that you guys are working on uh, as part of the DOE funded projects. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, the stage is all yours, Colleen. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shashi. And it's so nice to see you and also nice to see Sam and talk with you a little bit. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about my work today. So let me see if I can still share <laughs> my screen so that folks can yeah. see it. All we right. Can... You're good. OK. Um, great. Maybe I can move it over since I can't see faces. All right. Great. Um, yeah, so thank you for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the hidden half 
um, of ecosystem responses to climate change. Um, and of course, it's just my name here on the title slide, but there's many, many, many wonderful colleagues and collaborators like Shashi um, and Sam that I get to work um, with on doing a lot of this cool science, and I will thank them at the end. Um, and as Shashi mentioned, all the work that I'm going to tell you about today is funded by the Department of Energy's Office of Science and their Biological and Environmental Research Program. And I am at one of the 17 national laboratories funded by the Department of Energy. And I'm happy to chat more about what it's like to be at a national laboratory as well with folks. Um, if you want to find out more, you can check out my website. And I am recently back on Twitter. Um, and so I probably will tweet a little bit about this talk later as well. Um, so Shashi mentioned, I am an ecosystem ecologist. I'm particularly interested in understanding the cycling of carbon and nutrients between the living and non-living parts um, of the environment. And I use a lot of tools and techniques um, to do that from isotopes to miniaturized drone cameras to shovel omics. Um, and as you'll see in my talk, I do this work um, in a number of different places in North America. I'll give you a little tour today. I am particularly interested in that hidden half, um, the unseen world beneath our feet, that tangling of plant roots with the surrounding soil. And that's because soils are important. They hold twice as much carbon as the atmosphere, and they're particularly important in the high latitude biomes that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and I like to direct folks to um, one of my favorite TED Talks um, by Dr. Asma Asfaberhi, who was recently the director of the Office of Science at GOE, um, where she has one of my favorite quotes, which is that we should all stop treating soil like dirt. The other thing that I particularly like about studying um, plant roots and their interactions with soil is that I get to see something that not a lot of folks get to see. Um, and so they tend to be understudied because they're hard to measure, but we use lots of things like cameras. For example, you're seeing images from um, cameras that take pictures below ground, um, and you're seeing pictures of plant roots here, but you're also seeing that these roots partner with fungi in the soil um, to make a mycorrhizal surface where the combined might of both plants and fungi help plants to acquire those nutrients and water to support life above ground. So I have an overarching question um, that guides my research, and that is how the interactions between plants and soils might change in response to changing environmental conditions. Um, and so today I wanted to take you on a little trip to all of the places where I think about and measure these things, um, squishy bogs to frozen tundra and um, a few places in between. Um, this is one of my favorite maps of North America. I think it's meant to be concrete, but I like to think of it as soils. Um, and so I'll sort of give you um, an outline of where we're going to visit today. Um, so we're going to start in the past in East Tennessee in a temperate forest exposed to elevated carbon dioxide concentrations where I did my dissertation work. And then we're going to move into the present day further north into Minnesota and to peatlands where we're looking at multiple climate factors. And then even further north to Alaska, um, where instead of manipulating um, climate factors, we're tracking the rapid pace of climate change that's happening both on the North Slope and on the Seward Peninsula of Alaska. So starting in the past, right in our backyard here in East Tennessee. Um, so I am at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which, as I mentioned, is one of the 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories, which I didn't know were a thing until I came to work here. Um, it's a very cool place to work. Um, the Environmental Sciences Division here at Oak Ridge has a long history of large-scale long-term thinking. So unfortunate beginning with radioecology, but the opportunity to trace radioisotopes through the environment led folks to start thinking about systems ecology um, and be a part of the NSF International biological program, thinking about acid deposition, and then thinking about how to represent those processes and models that would let them predict processes across space and over time. And then in more recent years, thinking about how to predict the future by manipulating ecosystems to give us a glimpse into how forests might respond to changing water availability or extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and then leaving our backyard and moving further northward into important but understudied biomes like the tundra and the tropics and peatlands um, to manipulate and understand how those biomes might respond to the climate of the future. 
So um, here um, in our backyard in East Tennessee was the Oak Ridge National Laboratory free air CO2 enrichment experiment, FACE experiment, led by Rich Norby. Um, it began in 1998 and it ran for 12 years, which is um, another perk of working um, for a funding agency that's willing to fund a project for, um, for a long enough time to understand the responses of slow growing trees, for example. Um, and for someone like me who is interested in below ground processes, instead of understanding the response of, of plants to elevated CO2 in a pod or saplings in a chamber, we um, were able to leverage the technology at um, a national laboratory and build these large towers. These plots were 25 meters in diameter and 20 meters tall, exposing large portions of the sweet gum plantation to elevated carbon dioxide. So the two plots there on the left received elevated carbon dioxide concentrations targeting mid-century, so about 565 parts per million. The two plots there on the right just received forced air. And there's a plot in the middle that you can't see because it doesn't have the face apparatus, um, which we used as a control and there was no impact. Um, and to give you an idea of sort of the scale of this experiment, um, the road that you can see in the picture is a road that you drive on with cars and so you can see sort of the scale there. So inside the forest, um, it was instrumented to measure all of the things that we might care about to try to understand how a representative of the eastern deciduous forest would respond to extra carbon dioxide. So do the trees take up more carbon dioxide via photosynthesis? And is that carbon allocated to the growth of wood or to the growth of roots below ground using cameras? Um, and is it then decomposed and respired back to the atmosphere by the microbial community? How is that impacted by weather conditions, um, et cetera. And what we found was that a lot of the response of this forest to elevated carbon dioxide concentrations was below ground. So we saw increased growth of fine roots deeper into the soil profile, which had implications for nutrient acquisition by these sweet gum trees, carbon storage in the soil, and ultimately whether or not elevated carbon dioxide caused an increase in forest production. So one way to look at that here is to look at net primary production, which is the total amount of organic matter fixed by that forest over the course of one year. The way I've done it here is to subtract what was happening in the ambient plots from the elevated plots. So anything above zero is extra NPP, extra carbon fixed under elevated CO2. And you can see in the first year of the experiment that extra carbon fixed went mostly to wood, which fit the hypotheses that Rich and others originally had when the project started, which was that the trees would grow fatter and taller um, as they took up more carbon via photosynthesis. But in subsequent years, much of the extra carbon fixed went below ground to fine roots, that orange bar there. And ultimately, after uh, 11 years here is when this data set ends, um, there was not a significant difference in net primary production between elevated and ambient CO2. That extra carbon fixed went away. So ultimately, because we saw more roots deeper into the soil profile, we saw more root mortality, more dead roots being incorporated into the soil profile. And you can see that here, where these top graphs are the soil surface down to 60 centimeters. And in total, looking at root mortality and the red bars is sort of dead roots going into the soil profile under elevated CO2 compared to the ambient white. So more carbon allocated below ground means more roots, which means more roots dying. So because the carbon dioxide that we added to the face experiment was depleted, it was from a fossil um, fertilizer plant down the road, depleted in um, C13, we were able to track that carbon into the soil and we were able to see new carbon that came from the sort of addition of elevated CO2 to those plots ending up in both particulate organic matter and mineral associated organic matter throughout the soil profile. So more carbon coming in, more carbon allocated below ground, more carbon ending up in the soil, but that production response went away ultimately and it's because it was sort of this vicious cycle of more roots because trees are not made of carbon alone. They needed more nutrients and water to support that growth, but roots need a lot of nitrogen and well. And so it was ultimately this nitrogen limitation ultimately limited the forest response to rising CO2.
But I bet as you're sitting there thinking about what was happening below ground in the site that you're thinking of the wrong kind of roots. Not big and woody like this ficus in Hawaii or the kind of coarse roots that you might trip over as you're hiking around in the Smokies on the weekend, but tiny and short-lived. So these are my fingers. So the roots that we're talking about um, are narrower than this cord that's connecting my headphones to my computer. They're less than two millimeters in diameter um, and they're tiny but mighty. These are the roots that are doing the work of taking up nutrients and water for the plants. And so roots are pretty neat and that these fine roots are ordered like streams. So first order roots, second order roots, third order roots, um, as you move backwards towards the trunk. And a lot of things change across this gradient of root hierarchies. So changes in anatomy and morphology, chemistry, architecture, mycorrhizal associations, those little fun, fuzzy fungi that I showed you at the beginning, result in changes in how much water and nutrient acquisition can happen, how much respiration is happening, how long these li roots live for. Some of these first and second and third order roots live and die in the span of a year, whereas others up to that two millimeter diameter cutoff can live for 10 years. Um, and of course, all of these things change decomposition rates in the soil. And that led Kurt Pregitzer to put in a journal article <laughs> in 2002 that fine roots of perennial plants are a royal pain to study. And that is true, um, but it is a labor of love. So the Ornl face experiment ended in 2009, and our sponsors at the Department of Energy asked us to look at multi-factor climate change manipulation. So we know that elevated carbon dioxide concentrations are rising globally um, as uh, fossil fuels are burned and as we have sort of land use change. Um, but because carbon dioxide um, is a greenhouse gas, we know that it's contributing to warming and weirding of weather patterns across the, the planet. And so they asked us to look at the combination of warming and elevated CO2 and its impacts on an important and understudied system. And for us, that was peatlands. So that began the spruce and peatland responses under changing environments or spruce project in northern Minnesota that was led by Paul Hansen. Um, and a peatland was chosen, um, particularly a bog for this experiment because peatlands, which are a kind of wetland, only cover 3% of the global land surface, but store more than a third of terrestrial soil carbon in deep deposits of peat that accumulated since the last carve outs from the last glaciation 12,000 years ago um, because of wet acidic environments that are dominated by mosses. And so you can see here a little bit in the background what this peat bog looks like. Like. It's dominated by spruce and larch trees and understory covered with ericaceous shrubs and mosses. Um, and you can also see what uh, National Laboratory technology was brought to bear to build in this case, which were chambers that can encompass the entirety of an ecosystem um, and warm them up and add elevated carbon dioxide concentration. This experiment began in 2015. Um, and you can see a little bit on the left here, the technology developed at Oak Ridge National Lab for above ground forced air warming, um, but also below ground because we know that soil temperatures are increasing as air temperatures are increasing. And so there's heating rods that encircle each of these plots down to three meters, zero to three meters. And then for someone like me who cares about what's happening in the rooting zone, the rods within the plot are only heated from two to three meters so that you don't have hot spots in the rooting zone, but you have this nice sort of volume of warmed peat below ground that matches the warming received above ground. Um, and because we work closely with modelers in the work that we do, um, we warmed up these plots um, in a regression design. So instead of a yes, no warming, we have sort of a, an ability to look at a threshold of responses from plus zero degrees, plus two and a quarter, plus four and a half, plus 6.75, plus nine degrees C above ambient all day, all night, all year round. So that's up to 16 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the hottest plots. And then of those five warm plots, we repeated that at elevated carbon dioxide concentration of 900 parts per million. And that's because we wanted to just see if CO2 interacted with or impacted the shape of that warming response for the plots. <laughs> 
And this is what it looks like from the air, those 10 plots on the bog surface there. Um, and you can see the arrow in the upper left hand corner there is pointing to a full size door um, to give you some idea of how large these plots had to be to encompass mini bogs that were warming at different at different amounts. Um, the, the chambers are about 40 feet wide and almost 30 feet tall. Um, so for me, interested in what's happening below ground, uncovering the secret lives of fine roots that are growing in saturated organic peat um, presented opportunities. <laughs> um, and so I like to show folks this picture because it is a picture of what is happening um, below ground where the soil is made of dead and decaying plant material, generally sort of dead and decaying sphagnum mosses. And then this orange um, root here is a root of an ericaceous shrub, which in some cases are narrower in diameter than a human hair. Um, and so it is tangled with and given a big hug to this moss. And so that that's sort of the below ground system in a peatland. So before the treatment started, before the warming treatments, we wanted to sort of understand where roots were distributed throughout the soil profile. And so this graph what I'm showing you is um, peat depth in hummocks and hollows. Um, so on the left, you see sort of a raised hummock topography. And on the right, you see a depressed hollow topography. And then in light blue, you can see where the water table is. You can see why peat accumulates in these systems. It's wet, it's anaerobic, decomposition super slow. And then on the x-axis, you can see the dark blue bars are corresponding to shrub root biomass. Now. As we picked roots from soils that went all the way down to two and a half meters depth, we were very surprised to find roots growing below the water table level. Um, and so we got a little suspicious. And so we um, carbon dated those roots and we found that essentially what we were touching below the water table level was perfectly preserved dead bog bodies, dead roots um, that had a carbon age in some cases of nearly 6,000 years. And so you can see that slow de decomposition rate left even the roots perfectly preserved within the peat profile. And so the living roots were where we expected, which was above the water table level where they had a current carbon um, age. So once the warming was turned on in 2015, Elevated carbon dioxide was turned on in 2016. We were able to look at the interactive responses of warming and elevated CO2. And what we found below ground was that warming strongly increased nutrient availability in the peat and also the growth of those tiny ericaceous shrub roots. Um, and it also extended the below ground growing season. But even with all of those changes and what was happening with roots and nutrient availability, um, the warming and the drying of the peat just allowed decomposition to increase so much that the bogs that were warmed became a source of carbon dioxide and methane to the atmosphere. So first we observed more available nutrients um, in in the peat and particularly deeper peat. So let me show you in hummocks here at 10 centimeters depth and at 60 centimeters depth with orange colors being ammonium and blue colors being phosphate. And on the X axis, you can see temperature here. You can see at the 10 centimeter depth, we're not really seeing any increase in nutrient availability with warming. And because these are ion exchange resins we use to look at ammonium and phosphate, they're competing. They're competing with roots and they're competing with micro. So it could just be that competition for nutrients is stronger there, and we're not seeing that warming response in the resins. But in deeper peat below the rooting zone, we saw that warming exponentially increased nutrient availability in deep peat. We also found that warming increased um, shrub root production, and that in particular, it was the drying associated with warming that did that by 130% per degree of warming. Um, and this was led by Avni here. I haven't been pointing out the pictures. I hope you've been noticing those um, because these are all the fantastic folks that I'm working with, including postdocs like Avni who led this paper. Um, so on the y-axis here, you can see fine root production and the upper series of four graphs are looking at the responses of root production to soil moisture. And the bottom graphs there are looking at root responses to soil temperature. And it's hard to disentangle those. So she's sort of showing them both 
But in the soil moisture graphs on the top in particular, you can see that she has them backwards. So from left to right, it goes from wet to dry. So you can see it gets drier as it gets warmer. And 2014 there was before we began any warming above ground. And you can see there's not really a difference in root production with warming, although there does tend to be a difference between hummocks and hollows. So drier hummocks and wetter hollows. Um, and then increasingly over time um, with warming, you can see that root growth is strongly increasing in response to warming and likely drying in these plots. Um, we also found that warming impacted the below ground growing season. There's been lots of cool work lately thinking about the, um, how the below ground growing season differs from the above ground growing season in places like the tundra, um, where the below ground growing season has been found to be up to 50% longer, which is cool. Um, and we're seeing that warming impacts that as well in this bog. So warming extended the below ground growing season by more than 60 days in the warmest treatment. Um, and that's something that my postdoc Camille friend found. So um, I'm not showing you the, the phenology graph because it's a little complicated, but here you can see a nice um, sort of drawing she made that encompasses the below ground responses that we're seeing. So in the plots that aren't receiving any warming, you're seeing a reasonable amount of tree roots and shrub roots. And then increasingly, as you move from cooler to warmer plots, more and more nutrient availability, more and more shrub roots. And she found using these automated miniaturizatron cameras, more and more um, fungal rhizomorphs. So we don't see more tree roots, but we do see more root-like hyphae um, extending into the soil profile, which is pretty neat. And she also found that that growing season is longer. Um, she put together this really cool tour um, of these images inside the spruce bog um, at one of my websites. And so if you want to check that out, you can see these really neat images of um, hyphae, mycorrhizae, roots, um, and sometimes ladybugs um, that we pick up from some of these cameras that we have below ground. So moving even further north um, to Alaska, where instead of sort of using national laboratory technology um, to manipulate and build a possible climate future that we haven't seen yet, we are tracking the rapid pace of climate change in a part of the world that is warming three to four times faster than the rest of the planet. Um, and that is the Next Generation Ecosystem Experiments in the Arctic Project, NG Arctic, which was led by Stan Wilschleger until January of last year when I took over as PI. Um, I was telling Shashi um, as this started that we recently got the go ahead to um, go forward with a phase four of the project, which will start in October. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we planned there. Um, I like to show this image of um, the Arctic tundra from a paper by Ted and Michelle in 2018 with this amazing artwork by Victor Leshik um, because it sort of shows all of the things that we are trying to understand across the Arctic tundra. Um, and that includes things like microbial activity, but also shrubification and greening and also disturbances like fire and thermocrust and also differences between, you know, tundra on the North Slope that is underlain by ice wedges um, and then tundra further south on the Seward Peninsula that um, has sort of a deeper active layer and doesn't have as many of these ice wedges in it. And then, of course, all of this is underlain by permafrost, ground which has been permanently frozen for millennia, or at least more than two years, often for millennia. Um, and so these roots that I'm interested in only have a very shallow active layer that thaws and refreezes every year to sort of make their living in, um, which makes for, for interesting um, and unique combinations of traits of these species that that make their living on the arctic tundra the cool thing about the ng arctic project is that it's led out of ornl but it encompasses three other national laboratories, Brookhaven, Los Alamos, and Berkeley Lab, um, and also the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And the whole goal of NG Arctic is to make observations that can be incorporated into models that can help us predict the climate future, both for the Arctic and also for the rest of the world. Um, and so it's really 
emphasizing collaboration across institutions and across interdisciplinary teams um, to make this happen. And so it's been really great. Um, it's a project that is more than 100 folks in any given year. Um, and so it's been really fun to sort of make measurements that are possibly just one piece of a bigger puzzle, but then to get to see that whole puzzle put together by your team members. Um, we work at a different, a couple of different places. As I mentioned, we started in the Barrow Environmental Observatory on the North Slope of Alaska in phase one. And then in phase two, we also added sites further south on the Seward Peninsula. Um, there's three roads out of Nome and we work across all three of those roads. Um, and you can see in the pictures on the right, we work there across seasons as well. Um, and then in the very upper rightmost picture, you can see that I'm reaching my hand um, into a soil core that we just dug and I'm actually touching permafrost in that picture. So you can see I'm able to actually touch the bottom of the active layer of soil that roots have to grow into on the north slope of Alaska. Um, and so NGRCTIC is driven by this sort of science discovery questions ranging from um, landscape geomorphology all the way to um, greenhouse gases and plant traits and whether the Arctic will be wetter and drier and how does disturbance impact that. And then we're integrating these observations and can cross a number of models, including the land surface component of the Department of Energy's Energy Exascale Earth System model. Um, we are incorporating our new sort of model knowledge into six different parts of that model, which we're calling modules, model modules into this Arctic informed land surface model. Um, and then we are archiving our data um, at ESS Dive, which is the Department of Energy's long term data archival. And so our publicly funded um, taxpayer funded data are publicly available for use. Um, and as I was mentioning, you know, phases one through three, we've been making observations across Arctic Alaska um, to, to make this sort of Arctic informed land surface model. Um, and in phase four, we're planning to take that model on the road. So we wanna say, does this model that we've improved based on these observations in Arctic Alaska, how does it do when we ask it to simulate what's happening at these long-term research sites across the Arctic? And then if it does well in those sites, we'll feel confident in doing gridded regional and panarctic simulations. If it doesn't do well at those sites, we'll be able to understand what is different about those sites from where we've already made our observations and then hopefully make improvements based on that. And as you can imagine, um, working on a project that spans five institutions and up to 150 folks, um, you need to make sure that folks feel safe that they can trust one another um, and that we are an inclusive culture because that's where the best science happens. And so we think a lot about, you know, in the early years, how to keep each other safe in the field from polar bears and grizzly bears and, and harsh environmental conditions. And then increasingly over time, thinking about psychological and emotional safety as the, really the bedrock foundation for how we do science across disciplines and across institutions and so that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So diving in a little bit below ground, um, here is a boardwalk that you walk out onto the Barrow Environmental Observatory outside of Utkagvik, Alaska. Um, and this is land that has been lived on and stewarded by um, the Inupiat since time immemorial. And it is the UIC Science Native Corporation that facilitates our ability to use this land. And I like to show this photo because as we walk out onto this boardwalk, you can actually see where the ice wedges are underneath the ground. So the the little depressed areas there, those are waterlogged and they have different plant communities because right underneath it are these giant ice wedges that have formed from soil freezing and thawing and cracking and filling in with water. Um, and it just changes the, the geometry of the landscape. Um, and you might think that for someone like me who studies plants, that the tundra, which by definition is treeless, might be a little boring, but that's just because you have to look a little closer. Um, and that's because a lot of tundra plants put a lot of their biomass below ground to store carbon and nitrogen to escape those harsh above ground conditions. And ultimately some tundra plant species have five times as much biomass below ground. Um, and if you haven't looked, I really love these Kuchera drawings by Professor Dr. Laura Kuchera of just 
thousands of below ground systems. Um, they're available through Wageningen University. Um, and I think this is one of the sedges that we work with um, on the Arctic tundra. So what we found looking at sort of what's happening below ground across the Arctic tundra is that tundra plant traits vary strongly um, in the sort of the traits and the strategies they use above and below ground to survive these harsh environmental conditions. And so you can see here I'm showing three of the species that dominate that land surface that I was just showing you, two sedges and a shrub. And so you can imagine that a modeler would immediately think I'm going to treat sedges the same because they're the same plant functional type. But you can see from these photos that they have very different strategies. This Carex shrub, which colonizes the very wettest places, Carex aquatilis, makes a lot of roots. They live for a long time. It extends its toes, dips its toes all the way to the permafrost boundary, whereas the sedge eriophrum here is rustiolium, but um, mostly we work with angustifolium or um, vaginatum further south, um, makes just a few living roots, but those roots can really crank and take up nutrients at high rates. And then on the very furthest is the, the deciduous shrub that we have on the Barrow Environmental Observatory, which is, you know, this tall, it's sort of hugging in the land surface, um, but it's very shallow rooted, um, woody plant. Um, it does not like to be waterlogged, but it does associate, you can see the little black fuzzy bits with an ectomycorrhizal fungi, which you'll see gives it a competitive advantage at that soil depth, um, which I just said. So sedges tend to root more deeply than these shallow root deciduous shrubs with a mycorrhizal advantage, and that has implications for nitrogen acquisition. So in the orange dots here, it's those three species that I showed you. So the two sedges on the left and the shrub on the right, the orange dots are showing you their rooting depth distribution. So Carex tends to like to root at the mineral organic boundary mostly. Eriophrum likes to be at the surface, but also extends its toes pretty deep to the permafrost boundary. And then that shrub likes to put all of its root biomass just in that organic layer. And so we injected N15 into some plots at the organic layer, some plots at the mineral layer, and some plots at the permafrost boundary, because we wanted to see where these species were getting their nitrogen from and whether it matched their rooting depth distribution. And we found that these two sedges, so the gray bars there, were taking up most of their nitrogen from the mineral soil, even if they had more roots in the surface soil. Whereas the shrub pretty well matched where it was getting, where its roots were and where it was getting its nutrients from, mostly the organic layer. But you can see the difference in the sizes of the bars show you that the shrub not only was able to take up most of its nitrogen from the organic surface layer, but it took up way more nitrogen than the two sedges do. And we think that that is because of this mycorrhizal symbiosis, this partnership that it has that lets it compete with other bacteria and saprotrophic fungi in the surface um, and hang out there and get a lot of its nitrogen in the sort of drier, unflooded soils. Um, and so we think that, you know, these traits themselves aren't necessarily unique, but the combination of traits that allows these species to survive and thrive in the harsh environmental conditions conditions of Arctic tundra should be able to help models represent these strategies and these responses. And so another postdoc, Soren Weber, um, wrote a commentary on this very cool piece of New Phytologist by Gesha Blumeri, where she was trying to think if we could use um, sort of identity, species identity, to say from above ground what's happening below ground across peatlands and high latitude tundra systems. Um, and then Soren wrote a commentary on that and started to think about how models could use these unique characteristics um, of roots and where roots with arenchyma like sedges could breathe underwater and go deeper, whereas woody roots are sort of constrained to above the water table level. And you know what happens when you have that permafrost boundary compared to the water table boundary relationships with mycorrhizal fungi. And so just starting to think about how we can sort of leverage these traits to be able to predict how plants might respond um, and use that information in models. So I've sort of showed you three places um, in North America where I've asked some of these questions on plant soil interactions in response to changing environmental conditions, but that those are only three places and we want to sort of inform a global model and understand what is happening um, across the world. And so my colleague Luke McCormick and Schaefer Powell and I put together the Fine Root Ecology Database in 2017, where we gathered 
every bit of information on what roots are doing across the world um, into a database that is freely available for empiricists and modelers um, to come and grab. Um, FRED, which Schaefer originally was calling this database the Fantastic Root Ecology Database, and we decided we couldn't publish that, and so we changed it to Fine Root Ecology Database, FRED. Um, the largest root trait database in the world, 300 different root traits, um, and we weren't quibbling about what a trait was. If you've measured it, it's a trait. Um, from observations from across the globe, we've released FRED version three and it's out there now. And I was just telling Sam that we're hoping to get to version four um, next year, 2025. Um, and so you can see just like any sort of plant trait database, um, the data are not evenly distributed across the world or across types of traits. So we have way more data from temperate systems than we do from polar systems and from the tropics. And we have way more data on the root system. So anything you can measure in terms of taking a soil core and measuring what's there, um, then we do on what roots are actually doing, their growth, their physiology, their respiration, and, and, and what they look like inside their anatomy. Um, there are a couple of ongoing initiatives that are trying to remedy some of these place problems. The um, Arctic Underground is bringing together tundra root data um, recently published and the Tropical Root Trade Initiative, Tropy Root, is doing the same with tropical root data. So look for those um, new data initiatives coming soon. Um, and so then I wanted to end with sort of saying an overarching goal of the work that I've talked with you about today has been to inform models that can predict global responses to changing environmental conditions, both now um, to build confidence that we have them right and also in the future. Um, and so in a perfect world, it would look like this, just you know, beautiful zeros and ones floating off into the distance uh, from these plants. But in reality, it looks like this. Models have thousands of lines of code that they sort of use to translate real world observations into the virtual world of models. And for me, that looks like um, root phenology, root production, um, rooting depth distribution, and root maintenance respiration. Those are the sort of the touch points where I can inform what the model is doing. And then of course, you know, there's between 300 and 400,000 types of plant species in the world and the model can't represent them all. And so it groups them together by kinds of plants called plant functional types. Um, and the model we use has 14 non-crop functional types like um, deciduous shrub or C3, C3 grass or boreal broadleaf tree, et cetera. And so I can show you how the models currently across those 14 non-crop plant functional types represent the kinds of root traits that we're interested in and that we can inform with data. For example, the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you can see currently the model does not believe that any of the 400,000 plant species in the world differ in their root carbon to nitrogen ratio. The only good thing about that is that it's currently 42, <laughs> which is the answer to life, the universe and everything. Um, but we sort of see something similar for all of the root traits in the models. Um, there's opportunities to vary these according to different plant functional types, as long as we have the information to do that. So I like to say that we've got a little work to do, um, but as long as we keep our eyes on the ultimate goal, which is world domination. No. <laughs> Understanding um, how plant below ground responses vary in response to changing environmental conditions across the world, not just in a few places. Um, and so, as I mentioned at the beginning, all of this work is supported by the Biological and Environmental Research Program in the Department of Energy's Office of Science. I know that lots of folks have NASA t-shirts, but I always like to remind them that the Office of Science is one of the biggest funders of basic science research in the country. Um, and we have been grateful to be able to work on the traditional homelands of the Inupia, both, both on the North Slope of Alaska and also on the Seward Peninsula of Alaska. We work with five Native corporations there that have um, allowed us to work on their land, and we are grateful for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there have been so many wonderful collaborators and co-authors um, on this work, but of course, um, team science and open science is, is always better, and so we've been grateful to to be able to work with big teams as well. Um, and then 
one of the cool things about being here at the National Lab is that they actually have a podcast. And so if you wanted to listen to scientists talk about Fred or Spruce or the NG Arctic Project, um, you can go and check out the Sound of Science podcast um, from Oak Ridge. And I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thanks so much, Colleen. That was a wonderful talk. I think we have one question in the chat box right now from uh, Sigrid Dengel. Uh, great presentation, Colleen. Um, along routes, can you see annual rings like terminal bud scars like one you can see along coniferous twigs, making it easy to distinguish between the individual growth stages? Hey, Sigrid, how are you? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> a lot of fine roots actually aren't woody, and so we wouldn't be able to look at those sort of growth rings. Um, once you get past, you know, um, a couple of orders, say the first three orders, they do tend to become woody, um, but it's just kind of not the same, and I don't think we could see the growth rings there. Um, so a lot of the ways that we look at root age are with these images. You know, every couple of weeks we take pictures and we look at root lifespan. Um, or we use things like isotopes where we can to look at sort of root longevity and, and turnover and those sorts of things. Once you get up to coarse roots, I think you can, but then it gets tricky with shrubs, which you don't know where the first shrub sort of genet is compared to the ramets. So lots of exciting things <laughs> to consider when you're looking at roots in these systems. Um, I have so many questions and comments. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I, I can give one just to get us going while people are thinking of additional questions for the Q and A. Um, so you've sorted and you know worked with root data in tundra and peatland a lot, which we have several sites. There are five NAN sites up in Alaska. Not all of them tundra and peatland, but several do. And I know that root sorting there is so difficult and so time consuming, but so important. I think your talk really is very convincing that it's absolutely critical that we keep doing the work. But I guess, did you ever publish any methods papers on kind of best practices on how to do it? How do we do it more efficiently? You know, what are the biggest pitfalls? <laughs> I feel like you need to write a manual on this because it's very critical, but it's very hard. Yeah, great question. Um, so first, let me put a plug in for there's a community resource um, for Shet et al. 2021 published in New Phytologist that is a manual for all things roots. So like you could go check it out if you wanted to be like, how do I? And it's just everything about roots. Um, and my colleague Verity Salmon, who's here with me and who's done a lot of work in the tundra and I sort of tried to to put in like in organic soils like this is very different. Um, but there's just, yeah, it's more like the untangling than the like sieving, right? Um, and yeah, so I would say start there, but um, Verity has been gracious enough to sort of host folks here to sort of show them how we do it, right? Like to come visit and then we're happy to show, um, to share photos and advice if anyone needs it for sure. We might follow up with you on that. And Colleen, if you have a moment, you're probably busy. I'll follow up with you over email. I'd love to get the link to that paper. Yeah, I can. Let's see. But if you're busy, it's okay. We have some more questions coming in, so we can do okay. that later. I'll, I'll multitask, but you go ahead. Go ahead and ask. Okay, it looks Joshy, like were you couple, gonna go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, ahead. we have a couple of questions. One from Dave Barnett. Um, so the question is, uh, if there was to be time and funding for another big experiment, what would you do and where? Yeah, it's such a great question. I always <laughs> ask questions like this for people that I'm on their dissertation community committee. So well done. Um we think, our team thinks that the next thing we would like to do um, after NG Arctic is done is to think about that um, 
the boreal tundra ecotone and the encroachment of trees into tundra into sort of these novel systems and how that changes if it is sort of continuous versus discontinuous permafrost or in that discontinuous zone there and thinking about how disturbances like thermocarst and wildfire can sort of lead to tipping points right because the models aren't very good at thinking about thresholds and tipping points and so we think that that is the next big series of investigations that would really push the model to its limits um, in a part of the world that's important and isn't isn't very well represented in these big models. You have a question from Courtney Meyer. Uh, are the roots four to five thousand years old that were shown sixty centimeters or so down uh, from completely different species? Maybe. <laughs> so um, the interesting thing about this was the shrub roots are so distinct, so, so fine, you know, 40 microns in some cases. Um, and these roots had that morphology. They were very fine. But, you know, 6,000 years ago, I don't know if it was the same species of Ericaceous shrub that we had. Um, it could have been another species in the Ericaceae family, but I do believe that it was an Ericaceous shrub just based on the morphology of those roots. And okay. I put I put Gregoire's um, starting guide to root ecology there in the chat so <laughs> folks can check that out. We have a question from Chris Byard. Um, you mentioned the two growing seasons, below ground and above ground in the Arctic tundra. Is the below ground season longer on both ends or just the fall? Yeah, I think that most folks have been finding that it's longer on the fall end. Um, and that's because the sort of, it the the soil is frozen and then like you would get this increasing volume of soil over the course of the growing season is you can't really get roots cranking until that soil starts thawing and so mostly it's that the soil is thawed longer um, into the fall season um, and so even with ceased ended above ground activity, folks are finding roots are still still cranking below ground. And especially in these systems, rhizomes are particularly important as well for that carbon and nutrient storage. I could potentially ask another one just to give give people a chance to populate the Q&A again if they would like to. Um, so you showed some really interesting data from the manipulation experiments, you know, roots becoming progressively nitrogen limited or like this response to CO2, but that's kind of transient above and below. I'm kind of wondering, we're obviously not, NEON is not a network that's involved with manipulation, but we're trying to track these changes over time and measure these things like root seed and ratios or biomass above and below ground and partitioning. Do you feel like, is it possible that we could kind of see evidence for some of these things playing out just over the 30 year plan span of NEON? Or are those the kind of things that you really need to do these manipulative experiments to see? Do you have any hope that we could kind of test what you see in the manipulative experiments just by watching our natural ecosystems over a long period of time. For sure. And I think both are important, right? So like, I think some of the changes that we see when we manipulate a system, like changes in rooting depth distribution or changes in species composition leading to changes in rooting depth distribution, you'll see for sure, right? Um, and I think especially in parts of the world that are changing more rapidly than other parts, like the high latitudes, you would expect to see those changes even in, you know, a decadal time span. I think that um, we, the reason that we need both is because like the fundamental, the foundation of long-term observatory networks provides us that baseline of understanding, right? And is sort of data rich because the models need all the boring stuff too. That's what I keep telling people. <laughs> It's not just like the interesting process that you sort of want to measure. It's so carbon and the spin up and where it started and kind of where it's going. But the reason that we felt it was important to do these manipulations is because it's a future we haven't seen yet and that we won't see for maybe 50 years. And, it, and we want to see models trained, for example, on neon data 
do we think that they're going to get it right in 50 years? And so we have to kind of confront them with these manipulations, right? And so I think both are important, for sure. Looks like they have a question from Sam Simkin. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I was curious about the moisture aspect of the spruce and NG experiments. Did the water table depth change even though these were chambers? And what was that and was that logically logistically challenging to have? Great question. And that's something that the team put a lot of thought into, actually. So um, I neglected to mention this, but each spruce um, plot has a seawall below ground. So, so we were worried about that, right? You have a really high water table level across the bog. We were worried that in the plots that you were heated, you expect them to dry, but they're not going to dry out if water's just kind of coming in from the other parts of the bog, right? And so they enclose the below ground component of each plot with basic what they call a corral, which is basically interlocking seawalls. And so it constrains if there is going to be an impact on evapotranspiration, we expect to see that because the seawall keeps other water from flowing in. And we weren't really seeing a drying effect um, in the warmest plots until 2021, where there was like a generational drought and the plots had huge differences in where the water table lo what level was in the plot and it impacted microbial activity and even the recovery. So it was kind of cool to see. Um, and we do have wells in each plot. So we're tracking, we're tracking water table level because it's so important for the everything <laughs> in the plots. We have another question from Arjun. Uh, great talk. For data model integration, specifically getting the model right, what do you see as the bottleneck? Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, there's so many. And so I would say fundamentally, the first thing to do is to get empiricists and modelers to collaborate and to sort of speak the same language because sort of the model is really just a hypothesis about how the world works, right? And we all have that. We all have that sort of conception in our head. And so you really kind of need both. Like we brought Shashank to the field with us, actually, so he could sort of see the Chandra that we were asking him to sort of extrapolate over space. And 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 the modelers here have actually um, collaborated to put um, this land surface model into a Docker wrapper interfacing with Jupyter Notebooks so empiricists could access the model and see what happens when you're like tinkering with parameters. And so I would say like that's the people side of the equation, which I, I actually think is sort of the foundation and fundamentally important. But then on the other side, it's sort of this mismatch between the scale at which I measure things and the scale at which the model can predict things, right? And so that's we think about scaling all the time in NG Arctic. And so in some cases, the measurement I make in forming an algorithm might be really tiny, but then how do I test that? And how do I say what the measurements are across the land surface? And so a lot of the remote sensing scaling work that Shashank and, and Sam and others are doing is so important to that. And then we've actually used models of different scales. So there's some models that simulate at the scale of measurement, but then there's some models that help us to not average, but aggregate the information in a way that can inform models that are predicting at like 100 kilometer grid cells on a side, right? And so just... Yeah, I would say scale of measurement and modeling conversations. Yeah. I don't see any more. Yeah, last call. We do have time maybe for one more question if anyone wants to speak one in. I really appreciated also your comments about safety in the field, both physical and psychological. That was really appreciated, Colleen. So thank you for bringing that up and all the work you've done and promoting the importance of that in team science. So. Sure thing. Thanks for letting yeah. me chat with you all. So I'll just say as we're wrapping it up, we are done with official neon science seminars for the year. But next week, we are having a community dialogue to talk about mosquito pathogen sampling, kind of what we found over these first years, what that means, and maybe future directions for the data project. So if you're a disease ecologist or you have friends that are disease ecologists, 
consider inviting them to that. I did just put the link um, in the chat. That would be great to have one community participation. There's also a survey you could take associated with that. Otherwise, thanks again for a wonderful talk for Colleen, everyone who's attended this seminar and any others for the season. We will be back in the fall. Nominate speakers so we can have great talks next year and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.